we have a legal right to protest in this country. OK, it's written into human rights law. It's written from the European Convention of Human Rights. So we've got Article 10, which is the right to freedom of expression and Article 11, which is the right to peaceful assembly and it allows for peaceful protest. Now, this idea of of protest, this idea of us being able to express when we are not happy in society is an absolute fundamental to any democratic society. It's the difference between a protester and a freedom fighter. OK, if a country has this ability where we can peacefully protest and it doesn't stop people forcefully or violently, then it is a Western democracy. We are able to express our unsatisfaction with society, that we can express our feelings towards the government. You know, consider in this country, um, we can go down to London and we can protest within the remit of um, freedom of expression and not hate or anything like that. It, you know, you've got to be very careful, but we can go down to London and we can protest against the government. We just take that as a fundamental right, but there are so many countries where if you attempted to do that, you would be killed outright. Now, that's the difference between a Western democracy and something like a dictatorship. OK, we have seen various instances where the right to peaceful for peaceful assembly does not exist. OK, and that's that's the remit where it goes from protest to riots. OK, so legislation exists worldwide in one way, shape or form. Next slide, please. Thank you. So effectiveness. Now we have to consider how effective protests are. We have to consider how effective or what effect um, riots have. OK, if it doesn't work, then it exit, then it goes on to the next step. It goes from protest to riot to frustration to criminal damage. You can see how it how it sort of it, it, it grows in its shape and its viciousness. OK, some of the examples that we see here on the on the screen, um, we've got the salt march in India, 1930. We all know Gandhi. We've you know, we've studied him. We you know, a lot of people will have quotes of Gandhi on their walls. OK, but actually what Gandhi stood for was the idea that our people are being repressed. We are being controlled. We are being attacked in our own homes. So through the salt marchers, they literally walked hundreds of miles. And the I don't want to go too much into it, but it's actually there was there were laws set by the um, the English rulers that Indians could not collect and sell salt themselves because we had a monopoly on business in India. OK, so this march was literally marching to the coast to collect salt to use and sell themselves. And it was it was more sort of actually, no, you, you we've had enough. OK, in England, uh, 1913, the push for equal rights, um, the, the push for equal political rights for women. OK, finally, the Montgomery bus boycott 1955. OK, that's possibly the most famous single image of peaceful protest. I'll show you in a second and you'll know. But if we look at the salt march, we look at the suffrage parade, we look at the Montgomery bus boycott. As 2020, people living in the year 2020, we look back and we think, oh, Gandhi, amazing man, led to the independence of India and gave them their, their, their whole country back, the suffrage parade gave women equal rights. No, I'm saying that women still haven't got equal rights, but gave them the right to vote as a basis. The Montgomery bus boycotts, 
Next slide, please. The Montgomery bus boycotts. Everyone has seen this image. Rosa Parks. If you haven't, look it up. OK, this lady was living in a country where black citizens were treated as secondary. OK, ordinarily Rosa Parks would have to have sat at the back of the bus where blacks would have to sit and whites, white people would have to sit at the front of the bus. OK, they were treated as complete second citizens. OK, but today we will look at these people and see them as heroes, social heroes. But if you go back to the context of this picture and you look at the media, you look at the political storm, you look at everything going on around it. These people were painted as demons. They were social demons. OK, so we consider what's going on today in terms of the, the, the protests in America and in, and in England regarding Black Lives Matter. We look at everything going on and we look at how actually some people are being demonized for fighting for equal rights in 2020, similar to these people that I've covered. And it's a case of we are in the situation now and we are being told from the media how to react to these um, these occurrences, these these things that are going on in society. However, in 50 or 60 years time, our grandchildren will be looking back at this time and they will be saying, dear Lord, how did this even occur in 2020? OK, society was so bad that these things were occurring. Next slide, please. So. What we need to de uh, delineate is um, is peaceful protest versus riots versus looting. OK, what we have seen occur recently is the media are massively focusing on rioting and looting. OK, now you, we as criminal justice examiners, as lecturers, as as, as academics, we have to question why is the media focusing on riots rather than um, the idea of protest? OK, it serves the function of society. It serves the majority to. To paint these people in a negative aspects, OK, so we, we have to we have to examine in detail the hidden conditions leading to riots. OK, it's against the consensus of the media and it's against the politics of the time. OK, so if people are rioting in America, we have to look at why we have to examine society and we we see that actually the the, the protests, riots, revolutions, civil war, terrorism, OK, all of them in in every aspect come down to similar societal conditions and similar societal roots. It's you, it's not enough just to say, oh, you know, um, I I understand why people riot, but I don't understand why people commit terrorism. OK, it's a very it's a precarious thing to discuss in 15 to 20 minutes, but terrorism and rioting actually have very similar roots and similar causes. OK, and one of the older theories that sort of it rings true in my mind is the Davies J curve. OK, so it's older, but it still holds holds value today. Next slide, please. Now what we what we're looking at on the screen here is moving upward satisfaction moving across is time. OK, everybody in society living as part of society will have some kind of expectation in that society. OK, as you know, as as a. As an individual living in England, I have certain expectations that I have my freedom of expression. I have the ability to work, earn money and live my life in private. OK, I have expectations 
I expect that the government will not interfere in my life unless I break the law. OK, all of these expectations vary from country to country. Now, what we see is expectations moving along and we see reality start to curve off and dip out. OK, now I'm not so you know, I'm, I'm not the type of person and I know a lot of you listening are not the types of people to just as soon as something goes wrong. Oh, it's a terrible country to live in. It's a terrible government. How dare how dare they? There is a an, an acceptable gap where expectations and reality taper off from each other. We expect that society isn't always going to be rosy. The way that we live is not always going to be rosy. Look at the triple dip recession and then now the second the, the second re biggest rece recession and then we've got COVID. We've got so much going on. There is an acceptable gap, OK? But where reality goes so far from expectations, it becomes an unacceptable gap. That's when people will turn to protest and if they are not heard, they will turn to riots and dam and criminal damage. And if they are not heard at the very extreme end of it, they will turn to terrorism. OK, now it's this massively simplified, but you can understand how it's where people's reality tapers away from expectations. And what has happened in America it is not just that one person was killed by the police and everyone thought, oh, I want, uh, you know, let's this. How dare they kill this person? Let's go and, you know, cause some of the biggest riots we've seen since the 20th century. OK, it's it's a lot of underlying factors in society. Next slide, please. So. Um, it's important to consider the various approaches to deconstructing riots. OK, now this is the beauty and this is where I say with criminal justice, it's the it's it's the idea that we, we can look at criminology, we can use psychology, sociology and law. OK, we've got four main sort of clusters of of approaches to deconstructing anything in society. And that is the beauty of the course. It's the idea that we are not just criminologists blinkered into criminological theory and perspectives. OK, so each one of these four have a. Have a multitude of theories trying to explain these occurrences. Uh, next slide, please. So criminological. Basically, I mean, one theory that I picked out is Cohen and Felsen. OK, and what they what they state is that for a crime to occur or for criminal um, activities to happen, there has to be three things. A motivated offender, a suitable target and a lack of a capable guardian. OK, so these three things. Think about that for a minute. If you have got a capable guardian, are, will a person be more likely or less likely to offend? They will be less likely. OK, that if the police do their job and they adequately protect something, that thing will be protected. Whether it's CCTV, whether it's uh, police patrols, whatever. Think about the idea of a capable guardian. Similarly, a suitable target. Why do we think in America? Because they're rioting. Why is it that shops are being looted and burned down? Why are statues being taken down and thrown into canals and rivers? Think about the targets. OK, the riots were occurring. Pretty much to the doors of the White House. OK, they got so close to the White House and then that's when the army rolls in and they protect that area. OK, that is not a suitable target because it's it's overly protected and they've got no chance. OK, it's, it's it's deconstructing this and then the motivated offender. That's the basis of all of this. Someone has to be motivated to do what they're actually going to do. 
So in the context of rioting, the, the offender, the, the person who is rioting, has reached a point mentally where they feel that to riot is their only recourse. It's their only option. Next slide, please. Psychology. So the frustration aggression theory. This is a theory that has been around for decades. It's a really old theory that's been added to over numerous decades. Now, this is the idea of the frustrated state of mind, and I think that it really rings true. OK. Um, and it's the idea of the frustration aggression theory. So according to this theory, aggression is the dominant response to the frustration of an on ongoing response sequence. Now think about that for a second. The idea that when someone is frustrated, and I'm not just talking a trifling frustration, I am talking social injustice. I am talking about you being um, you being targeted because of your age, race, or your gender. OK, it's not just a trifling frustration. It is a constant ongoing repression. That frustration leads to aggression and that aggression will usually play out in one way, shape or form. OK, now this can be this. You can look at this on a macro level and you can look at this on a micro level as an individual. If I am frustrated, and frustrated and frustrated that may well come it may well show itself through anger aggression shouting just to be heard now consider an entire group of people in society who have gradually been frustrated constantly targeted that's going to come out in what we saw as explosive riots okay now we see in america the riots have kind of tapered off, but they are still protesting. OK, that's the difference. The anger, the the violence, the frustration it's a fast burn. OK, macro in, in its entirety, it's a fast burn. However, these the, you know, their human rights haven't changed. They aren't being recognized still. So the protests are still going, but that that frustration and that aggression has been and gone. Next slide, please. So sociology, we can look at conflict theory. Now, conflict theories are applied to inequalities found within areas such as gender, social class and race. So power inequalities are perceived by these groups and can then lead to conflicts. Not all conflict leads to violence. However, the bigger the perceived imbalance, the more chance that it can erupt in violence. Now think about the slide where I was discussing the salt marchers, um, uh, the suffragettes, Rosa Parks. All of these groups were based on conflict every single one of them and every single one of these groups had people killed as in within their group they they didn't organize a killing their people around them faced power inequalities and these were manifested in them dying okay it wasn't it wasn't um as clear cut as what we see today, OK? Um, but you've got to consider the idea of power inequalities, whether true or perceived, OK? And that is what usually leads to violence, or it leads to rioting. Next slide, please. So the last thing that I'm going to go through briefly is law, OK? Now, the rule of law is absolute. Laws must be followed or face punishment. OK, now what we have to consider is that law should be objective. Or should it be subjective? Now, this is a difficult one. OK, there's there's two there's two camps 
when we we look at law and we when we analyze the rule of law one camp is that law should be objective and it should apply to everyone regardless of situation okay that's that's understandable but then a, a simple example is um simply being present while looting is occurring okay if you are grouped with people who are rioting and looting and you didn't do anything but you are physically there do you do you serve the same punishment or do you look at it subjectively where a judge can look and say actually you know, I, I, I acknowledge that you were there. However, I also acknowledge that you didn't do anywhere near as much damage as someone else. It's really difficult, actually, whether we look at people objectively or subjectively. And you can see in law it has changed from one to the other and back again and so on and so forth as society changes. Um, what law does do, though, and what it should do is that it should put people off from offending. And what we actually saw after the London riots, if we remember them, was that judges were handing out the top end of a punishment, okay, to hopefully act as a deterrent. So judges were giving life sentences for people who um, committed arson during the London riots. Now, again, looking at this as a criminologist, I would question why. Why were judges giving such harsh penalties for criminal damage, whereas things like financial fraud gets less? Because property needs protecting. In any society, if you don't protect property, it loses capital. So you could argue, actually, even after the London riots, decisions on sentences were subjective simply because financially the country had to protect itself. OK, so it's it's difficult actually to to deconstruct rioting, to deconstruct um, all of these aspects in what is I think 25 minutes I've been going. And it's just nigh on impossible. OK, the more that you look into each of these aspects, the more it seems like a bottomless void. It really does. And actually, that's where my enjoyment of criminal justice comes in. It's the idea that actually you can go as far into the rabbit hole as you like, as long as you know where, where you're going and what you're trying to find out.